anyway we're going to call on holland davis and uh holland is here with us from san clemente california he's a founding pastor of calvary chapel san clemente he's also an um, international internationally recognized um, um gospel artist you know he's, he's made some fantastic songs that have been published through uh, maranatha vineyard music calvary chapel music capital music you name it he's got a tv station he's been on tv shows and um but his love is for people his love is for jesus and he's a child of the um of the jesus people movement back when uh, in the, you know the old days of um lonnie frisbee the jesus people chuck smith and uh we're just it's just a pleasure to have him on here tonight so um without any further ado i'd like to introduce to you all holland davis hello how are you I, i'm blessed to be here tonight brother and i hear that you're not only going to speak but you're going to sing we're going to get the we're going to get a double dose tonight brother oh my goodness <clears throat> yeah when uh uh abigail was speaking um i just thought you know she probably knows a friend of mine karen lafferty uh, who is the Karen Lafferty? Yeah, one who wrote Seek Ye First Kingdom of God. Yep, very that's same. A, oh, that's a that's a very awesome song. Uh, from She's when I was very like, huge with the uh, YWAM and with the DTSs and and also I think Paul Balash used to teach at a few of the um, school of worships and the uh, discipleship training oh my schools goodness. in different places as well. So another friend of mine. So. It's just a small world, <laughs> you know. But you were um, uh, you were talking about Psalm 23, and uh, and I had a, a different song plan, but I thought, oh, I wrote a Psalm 23 <laughs> song, so <laughs> love to hear it. So I thought maybe we should start with that. It goes, surely goodness. So follow me. All the days, all the days of my life, and surely mercy to cover me, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord. The Lord is my shepherd.
And um, I want to do a song that's kind of new to us, new to me. A couple songs that are kind of brand new to us. But as I've been um, just praying and thinking about the things that are happening in the world that um, I've just realized there's nothing like Jesus. Jesus is the only one, the only person who can get you through everything as we've heard many times tonight. And, and so the chorus is really simple. You can join in with me. It goes like this. Is there
people singing along there, brother. <laughs> By the way, it got a little bit uh, distorted, uh, the volume of the guitar, a little bit, yeah. I'm sorry. I just, um, we're, we're worshiping, I just got into it too much. We're worshiping, though. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, this song I just wrote literally like a week or so ago. Wait, I'm getting hot here. Worship is a full contact sport. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> but uh, I just we just wrote this and taught it to our church and uh, uh, taught it to a men's conference back in St. Louis and um, and so it's a it's a, just a song of thanks for all that Jesus has done. And uh, the chorus goes, um, Thank you for the blood of Jesus That washes white as snow Thank you for your healing presence The power to Salvation, restoration, future and the whole. Thank you. Thank you. What can I say? can contain the greatness of your love your loving kindness is faithful and true all I can Thank you. Thank you for the blood. Thank you for the blood of Jesus that washes white as snow. Thank you for your healing presence. Jesus. 
Jesus that washes, that washes white as snow for your healing. Thank you for your healing presence, the power, the power to make me whole. Thank you for salvation. for a second you know i remember we were at your church a while back and i think it might have been when we did the christmas thing and and before we, we ever all went on and facebook live and all that you said something i think during the prayer time that said you know if you're not writing songs you're not in revival mode or something of that nature and i go my goodness and i thought i haven't written songs in decades you know and i know there's songs in me and and for you to say oh, i just wrote this song last week and it's a it's an awesome song that means you took the time you took the time to get in God's presence to seek him for a song and he gave it to you, you know, but we get so busy, but, um, I'm inspired. I'm inspired. Well, they just kind of happen. I it, it, like, uh, like a lot of songwriters know it's like you, you don't, they just kind of drop in on you. You know, they're kind of like unexpected guests, you know, they kind of show up and, uh, and then you, then you just got to deal with it. Right. Uh, so you just got to deal with like when people show up at your door, you just got to deal with it. And, um, and that's kind of what happens with songwriting. Hey, Amen. Well, that's, that's a really good song, brother. I, I was worshiping along with you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm going to jump in to another song at the end, um, kind of an old classic Jesus song. Um, but I just wanted to kind of bring a message about the times that we're in um you know there's a in fact i'm gonna go into sh screen sharing mode just to kind of uh, give a little bit of of that here um but um you know the bible talks about times and seasons and paul said you know i don't want to i don't feel like i need to write you concerning times and seasons because you kind of already know them and as I was praying about, what does he mean, times and seasons? Well, times refers to the appointed times, which are the feast dates in scriptures. And everything God does is on a feast date. And so you can look at the, you know, there's seven feast dates that are in the Bible. Um, we're not going to get into all the different feast dates, Passover, Unleavened Bread, First Fruits, Pentecost, Trumpets, the, uh, a fe Feast of Trumpets, Day of Atonement, and Tabernacles. Uh, the three of uh, the four spring dates are Passover, unleavened bread, and first fruits, and those all perfectly corresponded with Jesus's death, burial, and resurrection. Uh, and then Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit was poured out on the church, was um, you know it perfectly correlated with um, the Mount Sinai and the giving of the Word of God. And so, basically, what Pentecost is about is not necessarily the birth of the church as much as it's about God now, um, you know, basically setting up his kingdom in the hearts of people. You know, on Mount Sinai, he, he gave his word to Israel, and it was through his word that Israel would uh, be governed by God. And then, uh, but you have the fall dates, and the fall dates have yet to be fulfilled. And we have the Feast of Trumpets, the Day of Atonement, and the Tabernacle. Uh, what's interesting is that in 1 Kings chapter 8, um, we see the dedication of the temple. And, uh, and there's some things that are, we're going to look at in just a moment about the significance of the dates. Because the second part of what, what um, Paul talks about are the seasons. And really in the Greek, it's the word chronos. And chronos talks about chronological time. Uh, and so you have this, the appointed feasts, which are set by God, and then you have chronological time. 
Well, what is he talking about when he talks about chronological time? Well, in the Bible, God set up a seven-year period of time that would occur. So there were these seven years that were supposed to happen uh, throughout history. And Israel was to begin counting these seven years when they entered into the land of Canaan. Uh, they began counting it the first year that they uh, entered into the land. And so in, uh, um, in 1 Kings 8, uh, we read that, you know, uh, in uh, verses 65, at that time Solomon held a feast and all Israel with them a great assembly from the entrance of Hamat to the brook of Egypt before the Lord our God, seven days and seven more days, 14 days. On the eighth day, he sent his people away and they blessed the king and went to their tents, joyful and glad of heart for all the good that the Lord had done for his servant David and for Israel, his people. And so there are two seven day feasts back to back, seven days and seven days. But the second seven day feast has an eighth day attached to it. Well, there's only one feast in the seven feasts that has an eighth day, and that is the Feast of Tabernacles. I don't have time to go through all of the, the, uh, the proving of this, but I'm just gonna kind of get to the point for the sake of time. And so, uh, and so on the eighth day, you know, so you have seven days and then on the eighth day, they are sent away. So the, the eighth day was interestingly referred to as the last great day. And so this tells us that the dedication of the temple occurred in the fall on the eighth of Tishri, seven days before the Feast of Tabernacles. And this is important because uh, Solomon begins building the uh, temple in a different portion of the year. Now, what happens when the temple is dedicated, the Ark of the Covenant is placed in the most holy place, in the Holy of Holies. And when the Ark is placed in the Holy of Holies, something amazing happens. It says in 1 Kings 8, verse 10, it came to pass when the priest came out of the holy place that the cloud filled the house of the Lord so that the priest could not continue ministering because of the cloud for the glory of the kavod of the Lord filled the house of the Lord. This is kind of uh, the scripture that inspired uh, the song, Let It Rise, Let the glory of the Lord rise among us. You know, the glory of the Lord filled the house of the Lord. Uh, and so this, this cloud, this thick cloud is so dense, it completely fills the temple. And it is so radiant, it's so heavy, that the only word that can describe what this cloud was is the word glory. And that word glory means abundant presence. That's one of the ways you can translate the abundant presence of God. And so the abundant presence, the glory of God fills the temple. It's so thick. It's so heavy, so dense. The priest cannot continue ministering. I would have loved to have been there. I would have loved to have seen that where, uh, where you can't even get into the building because of the electricity that's in the air. And so one of the things you notice is that God begins to work in patterns. And one of those patterns is in the area of numbers. Uh, and so there's uh, what I call kingdom math. There's two kinds of kingdom math. There's multiplication and there's addition. You know, how many of you know that God multiplies, God adds, God sometimes even subtracts, but God never divides. He never divides. Division is never in kingdom math. Just remember that. And so um, there's seven times seven, and there's seven plus seven. Uh, with Pentecost, Pentecost is this Sunday, uh, we see seven times seven plus one. Uh, seven times seven. You know, seven is the number of completion in the natural order. When you see multiplication, seven times seven, God is wrapping up the entire natural order. So it's, it's the complete natural order kind of all wrapped up and put in a bow. But Pentecost happened on the plus one. What happens when you add one to the natural order? You go into the supernatural order. 
So it's seven plus one. That's the supernatural. Jesus rose on the eighth day, the day of resurrection. Resurrection life is part of a new supernatural order. And so Pentecost, the Holy Spirit, is poured out on the plus one day, seven times seven plus one. And that happened on a Sunday. Sunday is the plus one day. And so, you know, as people of God, we the old order is completely gone. It's past. And now we are in the plus one. We're in the supernatural order. That's how we are to operate as the children of God. And so God completed. Uh, and so Pentecost is seven times seven plus one. And so seven times seven is a total fulfillment a total completion and one is the number of a new sap, uh, supernatural order by the way that's when god gave the word of god the torah on the plus one day at mount sinai seven times seven plus one the word of god is part of a new supernatural order that's the basis of the new supernatural order is the word of god and through the word of god god governs the people and as we do the word of God, we are governed by God. So God governs the people through the word. He governs us by the spirit of God. And so uh, that's something that we need to grab a hold of. We're new creations. We have a new nature. We have a new heart. We have a new mind. We have the mind of Christ. This heart of stone that is under the law is replaced with a heart of, sp of flesh, which is under the spirit. And the law of God is now written on our hearts. And so we want to do what God desires for us to, to do. Now, the next time God manifests his presence after Mount Sinai in a massive way like this is at the temple dedication. But this is different. This isn't seven times seven. This is a pattern of seven plus seven plus one. The plus one comes after the second seven. During the first seven, God fills the house of the Lord with the glory of the Lord, the abundance of his presence. And from that point forward, God is in the midst of his people. He's dwelling with his people. And so the literal kingdom of God was established on earth when God's glory descended upon the temple. And he's now governing from his throne in the temple. That's why when Jesus returned, where did he go? When he came riding the colt, he went to the temple because that's where he rules as king from. That's his father's house. He didn't go to uh, Pilate's throne or to anyone's throne. He went right to the temple. And so during the first seven, they celebrate the uh, dedication of the temple. During the second seven, they celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles, the, fa the fact that God is dwelling in their midst. So you have seven plus seven. What is seven plus seven? It's a double portion. It's a double portion of, of, of fullness. And the plus one day that they all go is called the last great day. And on this day, the people return home joyful and glad of heart. And so... We have the, this, you know, kingdom math. We have the seasons, the appointed time, or excuse me, the, the times, the appointed times, the feast date set by God. But there's one other thing, and that's the, the seasons, the chronological time, the timeline that God established in the chronology of human history. And God instituted a cycle of seven years. In the seventh year, the land was to rest and all debts were to be re canceled, released. So every seven years, you get to have all your credit cards uh, zeroed out. Imagine that. That would be unbelievable. If every seven years you could, you know, you spend seven years running up your cards at Nordstrom's and then on the seventh year, boom, they go back to zero. You can start all over again. Be unbelievable. Well, that seven year cycle began the first year Israel was in the promised land. And then there was seven times seven. Every 49 years, there was a plus one year. And on that plus one year, it was known as the Jubilee year. Not only was, and, and that Jubilee year began on the Day of Atonement, by the way. Not only were your sins forgiven, not only were your debts erased, 
But if you sold your property to um, to pay a debt, it was given back to you. If you sold yourself into slavery to pay a debt, it was given back to you as well. But the seven times seven years is known as a year when everything was released. And that is called Shemitah. The word Shemitah means release liberty was proclaimed through the land it was a year of rest but it was a double portion year of rest because the 49th year was a year of rest and the 50th year was a year of rest it was seven plus seven two years back to back just like in first kings where he had two weeks back to back plus one the last great day so notice the pattern the people would be joyful glad of heart rejoice for all that the lord has done now, when you take and you figure it out and you add up all of these dates, uh, I'm going to kind of jump past. Uh, you can go back and I preached this message at my church a few weeks ago, uh, but I'm just going to jump back to where we are today. We are in this year. We're coming to the end of the 70th Shemitah year, September 25, 2022 is the end of the 70th Shemitah year cycle since Israel entered the land. I went back and I actually calculated it myself to make sure that it was right and what people were telling me was correct. And so September 26, 2022 is the 70th Jubilee year. It's seven plus seven, a double portion. But then you have the plus one. The plus one is the last great day. And I'm just gonna jump right to the end here. What if the end of the Shemitah, uh, 70th Shemitah cycle marked the beginning of the 70th week of Daniel, when there would be a peace treaty negotiated with Israel to rebuild the third temple? And that would begin a seven year period of time, a second seven, that would be followed by a last great day that we read about in Revelation 16 that says that there are spirits, demons performing signs which go out to the kings of the earth, to the whole world, to gather them to the battle of the, that great day of God Almighty, referring to the battle of Armageddon. And on that last great day, Jesus will destroy every enemy of God and liberate Israel from all her oppressors and will restore them. And what's interesting is even the rabbis in Israel are saying that Messiah is going to appear to them in 2023. They are fully waiting and expecting for Messiah to be revealed. Someone who will make a treaty to allow them to build the third temple. Now, I'm not naming dates. I'm not, I'm not putting any, I'm not saying Jesus is going to happen. It's all going to happen this year. But what, it, what I'm saying is when we look at the times and the seasons and we put them together, it's just very interesting to me that everything just kind of falls into place in September of this year. It's just fine, kind of interesting how that happened. You know, it was kind of interesting how everything kind of fell into place during that Passover uh, week when Jesus was crucified. It was just kind of interesting how everything fell into place when, um, when Jesus was born and he came into this world and all the prophecies were fulfilled. And even the, uh, the men, the wise men that came from you know, Babylon seeking the king of the Jews, they, how did they know that? They followed the prophecies that were given. And so there are those of us that just believe that we are in the last of the last days and that the end of all things is at hand. And if this is the end of all things, how then are we to live? How then are we to respond? If you don't know Jesus, this is the time to give your life to Jesus Christ, to surrender your life. Because Tomorrow isn't promised to us. We don't know what the future is going to bring. We know who holds the future and we trust in him. And we know that if you, we believe in Jesus, we have a future 
and a hope in heaven that we're going to spend eternity with Jesus worshiping him. But the reality of it is we don't know when our final breath is going to be taken on this earth. I hope and I trust and I believe that it could be that my last breath on earth, my first breath in heaven is going to happen when that trumpet is sound and those who are dead uh, in Christ will rise first and we who are alive and remain will be caught up together to meet him in the air. But not everyone is going to go up in that call. In fact, the Bible tells us in the book of Revelation that one of the largest revivals that ever happened on the planet Earth will happen the day after the rapture, when very many people realize that they were wrong. You might have friends that you're concerned about. Don't wait. Tell them about Jesus. You yourself might be, uh, you know, kind of living life on the edge, on the fringes. Why do that? Get close to Jesus. Now's the time to leave everything behind to follow Jesus. And I want to leave you with this scripture in 1 Peter 4, 7, 11. But the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be serious and watchful in your prayers. And above all things, have fervent love for one another, for love will cover a multitude of sins. Be hospitable to one another without grumbling. As each one has a gift, minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. If anyone speaks, let them speak as the oracles of God. If anyone ministers, let them do it as with the ability which God supplies, that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belong the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. My prayer for you is that when that trumpet is sound, that you will be ready to meet Jesus. That you won't be one of those that waited, that was left behind, but that you were one who was prepared so that when Jesus called, you were able to answer. And if you aren't in that place where you can say without a, a doubt that if you were to die right now, that you would go to heaven, you can be sure. You can know that your sins are forgiven. You can know that you have an eternity waiting for you in heaven. And all you have to do is pray this simple prayer and mean it with all your heart. And just say, Jesus, I surrender to you. Forgive me for living life my way. Forgive me for breaking your law. And for anything I've done to offend you. I want to follow you. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. And give me the power to live for you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. And if you prayed that prayer, we would love to know. And so you could uh, you know, share it in the bottom of the comments and just let us know that you prayed that prayer. Or if you would like prayer, maybe you're struggling with something as, as, as uh, was said, we would love to pray with you. And so you can put your prayer requests as well. And we would love to uh, partner with you in prayer. But I'd like to kind of finish with a song that uh, uh, many of you will will recognize, kind of a, a fresh spin on an old song uh, about uh, the last days. Life was filled with guns and war and everyone got trampled on the floor. I wish we'd all been ready. Children died the days grew cold. A piece of bread could buy a bag of gold. I wish we'd all been ready. There's no time to change your mind. The sun has
time to change your mind How could you have been so blind? The father spoke, the demons died The sun has come, you've been left behind You've been left behind You've been left behind You've been left. So there didn't Larry Norman used to sing that song? That was a Larry Norman song, yeah. Yeah, and it was also in the Thief in the Night movie, right? Yeah. Yeah, wow. <laughs> that takes me back, back to the day. <laughs> wow. Yeah, we used to, when when uh, we were one of the first Christian punk rock bands, we were like before Undercover and Lifesavers and all those guys. We were, I'm going to Undercover so We used to do like an L.A. Dickies version of that song. I'm actually going to go to an undercover concert on Sunday, by the way. Oh, yeah. I heard. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, my friends have to practice right now as we speak. <laughs> wow. Yeah. So you were you were in a band before all that? Yeah. Wow. What was your band yeah, we, called? It was called Philadelphia, but we, we uh, because we're, we we're about love, but we got kicked out of a lot of churches because they just didn't understand the punk rock scene at that time. So we were doing punk rock and new wave and, but we were, you know, we were kind of, we weren't Orange County punk rockers. We were, we considered those guys posers. We were like, uh, you know, in, in San Diego County, it was more legit. It was more hardcore. And so uh, we would do a lot of, um, you know, we did a lot of stuff that sounded like the radio, you know, not like Christian stuff. What year was this? This is like 77, 78. So oh, wow. this is like, we were doing, our, our stuff sounded like the Pistols or like um, Elvis Costello, or, you know, we did had a song that was like Devo and it was just all the songs, music we were hearing at the time. This is like when the Go-Go's were like coming and playing in like parks and stuff like that in, in San Diego County. I thought they were in the yeah. 80s. They started in the 70s? Yeah. They, they, this is when they, before they broke. This is when it was all underground. Wow. So, yeah. So they would send us to churches <laughs> and, <with> you. <laughs> and the pastors would like cut our concerts in half and tell us we weren't Christians. <laughs> oh my goodness. So I feel like a baby then because I mean, my band started in 80, 85, I think. We're doing yeah. a reunion concert tomorrow, as a matter of fact, in, at the Reds Room Live venue in um, Vermont Avenue Baptist Church, you know. But, wow. Um, I guess you predate us. <laughs> yeah, I don't I don't know if we could even have a reunion concert, you know, because um, I don't know where everyone is anymore. But, um, yeah, we had uh, – it was uh, pretty wild. They started booking us in colleges and things like that because they that they figured they could handle it so yeah. do you guys have recordings by any chance from back at the, you know from that band um i might i might somewhere i want to hear the one that sounds like devo <laughs> well, that those were live we did like we we did a song uh called jesus is coming and that was the devo song but in the middle of the song i would uh, like I would do the the solo and then I would spin around and I get wrapped up on my cords and I'd fall down and do the worm. Wow. And, uh, and so like that was not like really cool to do in churches at that time. <laughs> so um, yeah, it was pretty wild. And then my, my, uh, my church, I was the worship leader and they just saw me, you know, on Sunday mornings and uh, midweek Bible study. And then they had a church picnic and, and said, hey, bring your band out. Uh oh. <laughs> and so we did. They never seen us before and we weren't asked back, but it was, uh, they just didn't know what to do with us. Yeah, they weren't ready. The church has come a long way since then, but yeah, it was definitely slow to receive Christian rock. Matter of fact, they thought the words Christian rock were mutually exclusive words. Right, right. 
Wow. Yeah, it's pretty crazy. What's the chance of us ha- hearing you singing one of those crazy songs tonight? Tonight? Oh, man. I got to see if I... I don't even know if I remember them now. <laughs> I hear a little bit of the cars and Rick Springfield sort of meshed into that song. <laughs> Rick Springfield. A little bit. That's, yeah. that's fighting words. <laughs> I definitely there heard the no Rick Springfield. Well, I'm not, I, I'm, I wasn't singing like I used to sing it then too. We used to sing it with, with an accent and all that stuff. <laughs> yeah. We do some of that in our, in our songs. If you listen to our albums, we, we throw on the, the British accent. If when I am alone, I long to talk with you. <laughs> one of you British accent. If. <laughs> that was one of our more poppy songs. But, uh, yeah. well, if you dig anything up harder than that, brother, or the diva one, send it, send it to me. <laughs> the diva one. That one was never recorded, I don't think. But... <laughs> Think that was it. <laughs> did it did it have synth in it? Uh yeah, we had two organs. One guy played a Vox Continental. The other guy played a uh 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 what did he play? Um one guy played a Vox Continental, the other one just played like a like a keyboard. I can't I can't remember what kind of keyboard it was. Was it like a Moog or something? Yeah, it was like some kind of a synth kind of thing. Cool. But yeah, we did. That was, was new back then, right? Since, since yeah. Been, yeah. Yeah, the big, the Vox Continental was kind of the sound, you know, that, that was the organ sound on all the 60s records. So. Very cool, brother. Very cool. Well, brother, it, um, <laughs> you've taken us on a walk down memory lane. Matter of fact, even before I even had memory of Christian Rock, that's pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> well, brother. Appreciate you coming on tonight and sharing sharing um, from, from the God's heart with the songs and with the with the word, brother. And um, uh, you've brought home a point that we may be living in the last days, you know, and that we need to not be playing games with God. <laughs> we need to make sure that that we're yeah. ready. <laughs> yeah, be ready, and uh, you know, we're to live we're to live ready. You know, that's kind of where we're at right now. I've always tried to live in, in such a way where Jesus might come back a, in a long time from now, or he might come back tonight and be, you better be ready either way. <laughs> yeah. Amen. Well, thank you so much, brother. 